Thanks, Mike. Uh, hi, thanks for coming to my talk um, this late in the conference. So I'll just give you a quick outline of uh, what I'm going to go over. Um, I'll bit briefly cover the, the sort of problem we're facing in radio astronomy these days uh, and the way that we're looking at moving it from a, I guess, a non-HPC background towards a, a very uh, off-the-shelf kind of HPC style uh, installations. Um, I'll go over some early lessons we learned last during some work last year and then cover some concepts. Um, this will be very short on practical results because uh, this is still work in prog progress, but I hope there's some ideas that will be useful. Um, so modern radio astronomy has basically transitioned from uh, the idea of a single, a large single dish, uh, single collector, to a large, very large arrays of smaller dishes. Um, this basically lets you uh, scale up much more easily than you can uh, the the engineering for getting you know beyond a hundred meter dish is just impractical and expensive. Uh, so it's much easier to build a, an array and then put all the uh, hard work into the into computers um, to do what would otherwise be done analog. Um, so we have uh, so an example of the SKA in the top right, um, or the concept a concept for it, for a uh, relatively low uh, high frequency dishes, and in the bottom right we have um, some antennas from the long, long wavelength array that a uh, very simple dipole system and they they very low frequency sort of zero to 100 megahertz range uh, and that that array is at 256 uh, antennas so what we're looking at is what happens if you try to scale this up to 10,000 inputs and the question is why would you want to build a 10,000 input array um, this is currently well out of the scope of what anyone is sort of considering in the immediate future but it won't be long before this kind of thing might uh, start to appear on plans. Um, so this is a picture of the uh, a, a sketch of the history of the universe. Uh, at the the far left, we have the Big Bang, um, and then goes through all the stages, the important physical st physical stages, uh, the Dark Ages, and then the reionization when the universe became transparent, uh, and then we have clear skies, and finally uh, us now, where we can do experimentation, or the physicists can do experimentation, and the astronomers can look back through all of this as best they can. So optical astronomy looks back as, as far as they can, and they, but they can only see back to the, the point at which the, the skies are clear um, and things get very faint and it's, it's very difficult to go further than that. Uh, and at the other end, we have microwave astronomy can actually see all the way back right next to the Big Bang. They can see the cosmic microwave background uh, and the very recent results of some evidence for inflation in uh, beam mode polarizations from, uh, from gravitational waves. Um, but in the middle, we don't really have anything. So the reason we might want to build a 10,000 input uh, radio astronomy array is because low frequency radio astronomy can actually pick up a signal from this middle region uh, between the dark ages and the uh, sort of across the epoch of reionization. And this could open a, a big window into a, an era of, era of, a, of cosmology that we've never, never looked at before. And the only way to actually make images of this region is to pretty much have something that's at least of order 10,000 input scale. So when, we're, uh, when we use these arrays, we, um, we basically cross-correlate them. This is, this is the, what the computers do on the back to make them look like one, make them act like one big antenna, and it's basically just interferometry. We, have, um, we sample, uh, sample the, the, the amplitude and phase of the waves that come in and then uh, cross-correlate them uh, that is all pairs of, of uh, stations, all pairs of antennas, so that we can then phase up to different points in the sky and make images. Um, this is a very compute intensive application. It's an order n squared for the number of antennas or number of inputs. Um, and the, the, the bandwidths are quite high too. So some would consider this a small installation, but uh, something that I've been working on recently, uh, a project called LIDA, we've got a 512 input array. Uh, we're, we're correlating that at 60 megahertz, and that equates to a 250 gigabit per second throughput, um, and that's in a, a very small cluster, but it's still a challenging data volume. So modern correlators basically work with an FX design. Um, the F is, uh, constitutes the channelization. We basically take the raw signals, digitize them, and then channelize them uh, using a a uh, Fourier transform or a polyphase filter bank, which is just a modified, essentially a modified Fourier transform. Uh, and then the second stage is the X, which is the cross-correlation. Uh, 
uh, and that's where the n squared sort of kicks in and, and tends to hurt. So the, the pipeline is basically you take your raw input, you, you put it through an analog to digital converter, and then you pass it through your channelizer into the, what we call the corner turn, which is really just a big network uh, transpose, um, swapping uh, inputs for channels, and then you pass it into a cross correlator. And then finally, with the output, you can run it through a calibration and imaging pipeline and actually get something that looks sort of scientific out of it. I won't be talking about coloration and imaging in this, but it's just in there for reference. Um, and these, these, these pipelines have uh, historically been run, uh, been designed using ASICs, FPGAs, CPUs, and GPUs most recently. Um, so for example, the, the very large array and the Atacar on the large, mil uh, large millimeter array, I may have gotten that wrong, sorry. Um, they use an ASIC design mostly, uh, and then the, the coloration imaging is typically done on, on CPU servers. Um, the submillimeter array, they do a, a all FPGA design for both the F and the X stages. Um, and some of the more recent uh, installations, uh, the leader project I mentioned I work on, uh, MWA and the paper project, they use a hybrid design with an FPGA F engine and then a, a, a just a Ethernet switch and a GPU-based correlator. But what we're looking at doing is um, is moving away from FPGA, FPGAs and all the firmware hardware type designs to a completely software design. Um, and what we really want to do is an all GPU all the time implementation. So we want to put the, um, the, filter, bank, the filter bank, the, the channelization on the GPU as well. We want to use not an Ethernet connection, but a, just an off the shelf HPC interconnect um, that we can basically make someone else's problem to install for us. Uh, and then of course GPU cross correlation and potentially even GPU calibration and imaging as well. That's something that we'll look at in the future. And this, this approach provides a lot of scalability and portability, and I think, very importantly, flexibility. Um, you can change software so easily that uh, it makes a big difference if you want to change, you know, add features and so on down the line. Um, reductions in development time are very important, but there's also a lot of challenges because we're not used to this, like our, the astronomy community is not used to uh, essentially working with HPC-like uh, systems. So, I'll give you a quick uh, recap of something that some work we did last year um, and some lessons learned. We, we tried to run a hybrid CPU GPU pipeline uh, on the Oak Ridge National Labs Titan cluster. Um, and this was basically we were running the F engine, that is the, the FFT, on the CPUs and then putting the uh, X engine, the cross correlation, on the GPUs with the intent of maximizing the flops we could get out of the GPU. Uh, and therefore maximizing the, the total flops, assuming they were dominated by the cross-correlation. Um, we did actually manage to sustain multiple petaflops, but we ran into a large number of problems. Um, first, we got very poor CPU performance. Uh, we were kind of shocked at how poor it was. The total workload for the CPU was about 0.4% about of the total work, and it was struggling. Um, it was holding everything else back, uh, which, which really just made us wish we'd gone for GPUs for that too. Um, MPI, uh, as was mentioned in a previous talk, it, it really didn't like our pipeline infrastructure. We had a process-based pipeline where each task in the pipeline was a separate process and uh, calling fork and so on, MPI just kind of exploded but didn't really tell you it had exploded and it's a bit of a mess. Um, and when we did get it working, the altar wall, which is the basically just the one line corner turn, um, the scaling stalled at uh, around 2,000 nodes. Um, so this is actually a plot of the scaling, some of the scaling we saw when it was working. Uh, and everything looked good up to this point, and then it didn't go any further. Um, so this is a log-log axis, and uh, it, it's pretty much linear with a little dip. I think that was a transition um, beyond one, uh, one, one rack, or uh, yeah. Um, and the full Titan requirement, the blue point on the top right, is all we needed, but we, we didn't actually end up getting there. So with those lessons learned, we decided to go for a look at a new design. Um, and uh, basically, we just addressed the things we, we, we saw. So the first thing was, forget about the CPU. Let's just go all GPU F engine as well. Um, we, we couldn't do a process-based pipeline anymore for the MPI problem, so we moved to a thread-based pipeline infrastructure. Um, and we thought that a sort of a more unified correlator architecture, uh, which actually parallels the unified shader architecture of GPUs quite closely, um, in that instead of having a set of nodes for, F, for the F part and a set of nodes for the X part, 
we just have uniform nodes and all nodes do both. Uh, and that simplifies a few things. The, the corner turn literally becomes a very simple all-to-all -all, um, that's, that's just a uniform distribution of messages. Uh, and it also potentially lets you scale, um, like dynamically once you've deployed even, uh, scale your bandwidth to the number of an antennas ratio. So if you want a, a subarray, but you want to do a really large bandwidth, you can just twiddle some factors and um, the hardware will just adapt because it's, it's unified. Uh, that's much harder to do if you have um, hardware specific implementations of the FNX. And ideally we want to be able to strong scale list so that we can basically just add nodes and get more bandwidth, um, hopefully directly proportional. So the plan for the implementation is basically to lean heavily on the existing libraries that are available. So the CUFFT library, obviously for GPU FFTs is the way to go. Um, the XGPU library, which I'll go over a little bit more detail later for doing the cross correlation and MPI. Um, and we only really need a, a few little custom parts beyond those. Uh, reordering and repacking are always little annoying things you have to do between other operations. And we needed a flexible ring buffer implementation to let us stitch the pipeline together uh, with, with CPU threads and so on and not run into problems. So using a, basically using, uh, we're using one thread per CPU, uh, sorry, one thread per task, and uh, this is CPU thread, so that each task runs completely asynchronously and they communicate via ring buffers. So essentially this gives us implicit overlapping of all the parallel resources that we have available. So if, you, if you're running something on the CPU and the DMA engines for PCI express transfers, concurrent kernels even, uh, and the network for MPI, all of that will just overlap wherever possible um, because everything's running asynchronously and just operating through shared ring buffers uh, to communicate. Uh, and we also make sure that they don't block the GPU by uh, each task by having their own stream and then using the asynchronous copy or whatever API kernel launches and then stream, stream synchronizing after that. Uh, the ring buffer implementation is, it could be described as a single publisher, multiple subscriber system. Um, and you can actually dynamically subscribe and unsubscribe, which is useful for responding to dynamic events that you may have in your pipeline. Um, and this lets you basically build up flexible branching pipelines, uh, which uh, lets you add functionality quite easily. Um, we've, it, uh, our implementation supports custom allocators, so we can, we can basically have a host ring buffer or a device ring buffer or a pinned host ring buffer or whatever else we want. Um, and so basically the, you know, the start of the pipeline, you'll have a host one, we have a host one, and then lots of device ones, and there's, you can just add a copy task that'll just asynchronously copy between the host and device and uh, that just all kind of works. Uh, and there's also some support for uh, sort of overlapping buffers, that is uh, some of the some operations you need to do kind of a convolution. So you need to kind of copy the end of the previous buffer to the beginning of the next buffer. And so that's built into the buffers, the ring buffer system so that, that uh, it just appears that that's sort of magically being overlapped for you. So the F engine um, basically just uh, it starts by starts the pipeline off by copying the de some digitized data. In our case, we're just um, generating fake data, but uh, it would, in theory, copy raw digitized data from the host to the device. Um, we're very careful with the number of bits we use because uh, bits are expensive to transfer, and in astronomy, we tend to be heavily noise dominated, so we can actually get away with quite few bits often. So we, um, the leader system uses eight bits, some use 12. 16 would actually be quite high, I think. Um, and then the polyphase filter bank, which is just a finite impulse response filter, as was described in the previous talk, uh, and then a, 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 a batched 1D real to complex FFT. Uh, and this diagram just shows the difference in response. This is essentially the reason we're using a polyphase filter bank instead of a straight FFT. You get much better isolation of each channel. The blue curve shows that it's a um, nice contained signal in that channel as opposed to the, the wings that come out of the FFT. The corner turn or the, uh, the, the all to wall communication bit uh, is just the MPI all to wall call um, that does all the hard work for us. We do a couple of in memory reorders before and after calling this to make sure that the message, si message sizes are maximized. Um, and the modern implementations of OpenMPI and MVAPitch and things have GPU aware MPI. We basically just give it GPU buffers and it takes care of streaming and pipelining and whatever it wants to do internally to hide the uh, PCI Express. Uh, latency and bandwidth issues and so on. Um, so that makes life very easy. Uh, 
but the, the scalability of this is critical. Um, this basically determines uh, a lot of the time the scalability of the, the application overall. So this is, but this is a good thing because, um, I mean, the HPC community has been doing this for decades. So we can just leverage all of that rather than having to roll our own uh, you know, UDP transfers or things, which is commonly done before. Uh, and finally, the X engine. Um, this is basically where the hard, the hard, heavy compute work is done. We're doing lots of, it's basically just lots of uh, complex multiply accumulates. The uh, equation is, can be written like that in the top corner there. Um, so it just does an outer product and then sums over time, uh, which is integrating over time. Um, we, ha we use the XGB library that uh, essentially Mike wrote. Um, this is highly tuned for the CUDA architecture and, uh, and runs very well on Kepler and extremely well on Maxwell, it turns out. Um, it uses a hierarchical memory tiling approach to minimize the memory overheads. This is it's very similar to the way um, some of the BLAST libraries work, DGEM and so on, use very similar approaches. Uh, and there's a lot of other optimizations that I, some of which I discussed in my talk last year, if you're interested. Um, but how do we go even faster? So this is kind of the, the standard way of doing things, but what's the next step? Um, so there's a few fairly obvious things. PCI Express version three, we don't actually have access to at the moment, but I mean, it, it's obviously available, just not in the, in the systems we've been using. Um, but that's, that's a two by speed increase in the, or bandwidth increase in the PCI Express transfers. So that's obviously of, of use. Um, GPU direct RDMA, it's probably better for latency bound applications, but it, it, there's a chance that it will help us to um, minimize some of the extraneous operations and, and reduce CPU load, I think is, is important as well. Maxwell, obviously, uh, the next generation, um, better, better efficiency, better power efficiency. Um, and NVLink also sounds very interesting, but uh, it's not a lot to say about that at the moment. We'll have to wait and see. Um, and some ideas for reducing memory bandwidth. We, um, something that would be interesting to look at is like real-time compression, uh, and also things like kernel fusion. Uh, and instead of having to, say, load in 32-bit you know, fl floating point data in and out of your FFT, um, when we only actually have four bit data at that point in our pipeline, uh, that's complete overkill. Uh, so something, being able to fuse in a little four bit or eight bit loader on the, F, the ends of the FFT would be really useful. And uh, NVIDIA are working on this, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, and finally, what, what about four bit compute? So we're doing all our operations in, um, in 32 bit because uh, it has the highest throughput, um, the float, floating point is obviously the, the, the fastest way to use your GPU. But we only need four bit multiply add. So I, we wondered whether there was a way that we could hack, hack floats to do a couple of these for us in one go. So it turns out that you can actually pack two four bit values into a single 32 bit float and then use it as if it's just an, an integer, a 24 bit integer, uh, and you get a free parallel operation on both values. Um, and with the number of bits you have available, you can accumulate a four bit value uh, once you've multiplied uh, up to 18 times before you start to overflow and you have to move it out into a bigger type. Um, unfortunately, this, this 18 uh, accumulation limit does hurt um, and it means that you can't, we, we typically have many thousands of integrations, so you can't just uh, go through that and, um, without a lot of overhead. So that ended up killing the performance for this. Um, but then we wondered what about doubles? We got even more bits. So the four bit uh, double trick is uh, it's even better because you can actually pack, um, you pack two four bit values into, a, into one double and you pack another two into another double and then you just multiply the doubles. Um, and that actually gives you uh, not only just the, the product of the two values, but it gives you all the products you need for a complex multiply. Um, and the only difference between that result and a complex multiply is the, uh, taking the subtraction of the, the first and the last term. So essentially this has done a complete complex multiply in one operation. Um, so this is technically a four for one speed up, but for the fact that double precision is, it has a reduced throughput. So on Kepler, that's a third, and so we end up with a um, four, factor of four up and a factor of three down. You end up with a 33% speed up in theory, minus the uh, pre-processing and post-processing overhead. Um, and it turns out that it also seems to decrease the power consumption by a little bit, which is kind of handy. Uh, so just to conclude, um, GPUs are now powering some of the world's biggest radio telescope arrays, and it looks like they're set to kind of almost take over this, 
domain of uh, computation. Um, HPC is a very competitive solution for radio arrays uh, and general signal processing. Um, and the purely software approach like this has a lot of advantages. We think flexibility might be the key in uh, future deployments where we can, you know, astronomers might, scientists might change their minds and ask, demand new functionality, and we can, we can hand that to them very easily. Um, and being able to integrate new advances really easily is a huge benefit. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you.